Hey everybody, welcome back to the TUM AI lecture series. Today we're, uh, we'll, we'll have Rana Hanaka, who's an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Chicago. She leads the Threedle group and she received her PhD in 2021 from Tel Aviv University. So she's already established herself as a rising star in machine learning for 3D particularly with um, new neural network designs on meshes, and recently some super cool work in connecting language with 3D mesh stylization. So today she'll be speaking about shape editing gener generation and stylization. Thanks, thanks Angela. Um, also thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here uh, virtually. Hopefully we can meet in person soon uh, at a conference or whatever. Um, okay, so as Angela already mentioned, um, I'm from University of Chicago. Uh, I am a new assistant professor and I uh, started a group here called 3 dl 3DL. Um, I'm in this building right now, it's really, really nice. Um, and when it's not snowing, the quad is like really beautiful and green. Um, and we're a couple minutes uh, from downtown Chicago. so. If you're in the area, please uh, reach out to me and uh, come visit us. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, generating and creating uh, 3D uh, content, 3D models, uh, for which is important for um, a range of applications. And the demand is kind of growing um, faster than we can um, kind of like keep up with it. So. A lot of our interactions today, including this one, are happening virtually, and we need to create lots of 3D models in order to uh, create these sort of immersive and um, augmented uh, reality experiences. And this is really important for also movie making and games and, and other things as well. So, there's also this new uh, big driver in computer graphics to generate and simulate various um, environments or scenarios. So we can use virtual environments to train all kinds of AI agents um, to interact with these sort of uh, physical, physical interactions in a virtual 3D world to train a robot, for example, to navigate um, or have some type of uh, self self driving car like simulation, and even the things that we produce in physical reality, right? We first need to generate and simulate them on a computer. So this is true when we have to design a building, create uh, floor plan layouts, um, room layouts, uh, engineering, manufacturing, all sorts of different um, applications that require first digitally uh, producing these models before we um, create them in physical uh, reality. So we're witnessing this like amazing explosion, amazing unprecedented success of um, 2D image uh, generation that's kind of semantic and intuitively controllable. And we see these high, extremely high quality results. And naturally, given these sort of interesting applications that I just mentioned, and so many more, we there, there'd be like a, a sort of a, a, a question here, why can't we just extend these uh, 2D uh, deep learning models to 3D? And we, we really still aren't seeing um, the same success in 3D yet, and it's because there's some uh, fundamental challenges that persist in extending uh, deep learning to 3D shapes. So using deep learning to uh, generate 3D shapes is still really challenging for a lot of reasons. Um, and I can summarize it in one word, it's data. Uh, data is the problem. So we just don't have the same uh, scale of data sets in 3D as um, we do in 2D images or even uh, language. And we know that these deep learning models are data hungry, right? They, 
They require a ton of data, even if it's unsupervised. And we have this kind of uh, curse of dimensionality, right? We have this extra dimension of 3D, and that means that we need more data than the 2D counterpart, and even more than the, the 1D, uh, like language counterpart. And like, so not only do we need more data, we actually have less of it. Um, so second challenge is that there is a lot of data out there um, in the wild, but we can't really that easily use it because this high visual uh, quality doesn't imply compatibility for geometric computation. So a lot of the data in the wild is, it's not manifold, um, it's not watertight, it has boundaries, for example, it has uh, self-intersections, and has polygon faces with incorrect normal orientations. And these are just some of uh, the many problems that uh, we face when processing this kind of data in the wild. And our uh, 3D processing algorithms can't always effectively handle these cases. And that will just ultimately, again, restrict the amount of data that we can actually train on. And if we need to create uh, more of this 3D data by hand, it's still um, difficult and mentally taxing even for the most uh, seasoned experts because modeling software is still excessively uh, manual and tedious and unintuitive. And so today I'm excited to uh, share with you uh, our like one of the first works out of our group at U Chicago, which is um, using deep neural networks to edit, generate, generate and stylize uh, shapes. And this is kind of in spite of these uh, challenges that I mentioned to you just now. So even though we lack uh, 3D data, it doesn't rely on a 3D data set. And um, despite this kind of high bar uh, for geometric computation, we can, st it still works on sort of low quality um, 3D models and it's also a very intuitive tool for uh, creating and, and editing uh, 3D data. So this work that I'm gonna talk about today is our uh, recent work called text to mesh And the, the key idea is that we want to provide some intuitive controls for editing and manipulating a 3D object. Um, through uh, stylization. So let's say we have this um, input 3D mesh um, and we use the text prompt uh, colorful crochet candle. Our framework is going to add uh, fine-grained geometric details and controls over um, the 3D input shape. And the way that we uh, do this is we use natural language as the means for describing the desired style. And I think that's pretty cool because that's how you would probably explain or express yourself to uh, an expert 3D modeler about sort of what type of um, object you would want to create for you. And in this work, we define uh, content as the global uh, structure prescribed by some uh, input 3D mesh. And this is going to define the overall shape surface and the topology. So I think meshes are a good choice for representing 3D content because they faithfully portray the structure of uh, shapes. They can accurately represent sharp features, uh, extrinsic features. They have a high level of detail and they're the most popular representation of 3D shapes in computer graphics. So they're fast to render and they're more intuitively editable than say um, other representations. And we can also easily deform them and uh, efficiently add textures and uh, so on. So in this work, the mesh defines the 3D content and that's going to kind of prescribe the, the geometric shape structure, the overall structure. And we define style as the appearance um, that's determined by the sort of color and fine-grained uh, local geometric details over the shape. 
So I think this definition is interesting because if you think about it, we can ensure that the stylization is going to preserve this original 3D content by producing uh, complementary style attributes over the, the mesh elements. So um, if we just add colors and small displacements along uh, the vertex normal, we're going to sort of by construction maintain the 3D content. And we do this using what we call a neural style field, so NSF. Um, the NSF network will stylize the input 3D mesh to adhere to the target um, text, and it's still going to maintain the 3D content. So the weights of the, the neural style field uh, network produce these colors and, and local um, geometric details over the input mesh. So on the one hand, we enforce that the, the displacements are small, and this is going to ensure that the content is preserved. But on the other, we still want to obtain meaningful geometric displacements. And so I'll talk about um, in, a, in a few slides how we do that exactly, but basically you can see the, the, the result here of sort of removing the color from, from the stylized result. You can see that we still produce we've actually produced like meaningful geometry in terms of uh, cactus. So this, this is kind of neat because we get this um, disentanglement by construction. So if we take a single uh, 3D object as input and we um, stylize it towards different uh, text prompts, we, we get this like correspondence across the shapes and we do this without requiring a 3D data set. So how do we do it? We achieve it um, through uh, rendering 2D images as, and using that as a means to manipulate the 3D object. And this is kind of interesting because it will allow us to leverage the abundance of uh, 2D data sets that are out there. And I think that um, when you think about it, right, like a natural cue for modifying the, um, the appearance of an object is by observing how it looks in 2D, right? Not necessarily having to do the, the analysis of 3D, which is typically how we, we tend to do it. And so I think it's, it's an interesting way of thinking about um, solving the stylization problem is through uh, these 2D edits. But actually going from 2D sort of back to the underlying 3D geometry um, and kind of inferring the, the scene information, the colors, the lighting, and all the textures and the materials, this so-called inverse graphics is uh, really challenging. And I think it's even challenging to do forward graphics, right? Like to produce a um, sort of photorealistic scene by hand is, is challenging uh, even for experts. And so I think like this is one of the reasons I'm excited about this I'll work is because it shows that we can actually do inverse graphics, like editing 3D meshes um, through these 2D projections using this uh, semantic loss. So this slide is going to present kind of the high level gist of this approach. So we first, um, we render out uh, the 3D object into um, 2D images, and then we encode them uh, through this image encoder that maps them to a uh, 512 dimensional uh, feature vector. And this abstracts away, like if you think about it, it abstracts away all the spatial information, right? Like it was some, I think in this case, 224 by 224 pixel image. And then it goes down to one by 512. So everything uh, that has to do with potentially artifacts in the rendering or anything like that is just kind of compressed down into one spatially robust uh, representation. I say robust, um, and I'll explain why later. But this representation of 512 dimensional feature vector is uh, something much higher level and sort of more semantically meaningful than just the, the raw pixel values. Um, in addition to that, we can also encode uh, into the same 512 dimensional feature vector space um, some text. 
And this embedding space is shared. It's a joint image uh, text embedding space. And that allows us to compute the similarity between these two, um, the 2D production of the geometry and the encoding of the text. And that's a sort of meaningful signal that we can use to update the geometry. And it's semantic and high level enough to, to, to do meaningful updates to the scene. Um, and so we use these, like I mentioned, joint um, image and text embeddings. Specifically, we use something called Clip. Um, if, yeah, if you don't know about it, I definitely recommend reading it. I'm happy to explain it after. But basically, it's been trained on millions and millions of pairs of images and, and text and encourages uh, similar pairs to be similar and uh, pairs that should be similar to be similar in this embedding space. So what's amazing, I think, is that we abstract this image to a 512 dimensional feature vector. And then somehow from that 512 dimensional feature vector, we're able to expose part aware semantics, which I think has been intriguing to all of us, all of the authors on this paper, like how it can effectively understand the pants or the shirt or the the hair of, of Steve Jobs or to add years on Batman requires it having some type of understanding of what it's seeing. And it's amazing that it can somehow uh, put that back into the 3D geometry without any um, data set. And another thing that I think is pretty intriguing about it is that we can so here we have this like lamp made, made of bricks. Um, and we can see that the bricks, like they align to the sharp uh, curves or the sharp features of this, of this lamp. And like traditionally we would sort of have to estimate these lines in 3D and then we kind of would orient the textures along this um, shape. And here without having to solve any of these kind of complicated problems without having to do any uh, parametrization, we still get um, a, a 3D object, which is texture aligned to sharp features. So I think that's uh, really cool. So we have this uh, neural style field network and it stylizes the uh, 3D input mesh to adhere to the target text. Um, Specifically, this neural style field network, it learns to map points on the mesh surface to RGB, to an RGB value and a displacement value. Um, so specifically what that looks like is we have uh, an MLP, which takes an XYZ uh, point on the mesh that goes into like um, one by one convolution like MLP, um, which predicts for each XYZ point, a three vectored color and a one valued scalar displacement, which is uh, a displacement along the, one, the normal. So the combination of those, we add back to the, the original mesh and we get something that's uh, stylized. And I'll, talk, I'll show you uh, why this happens in, in a moment, but basically that uh, result will not necessarily have a high frequency details, which we are looking for when we do stylization. So um, we add this positional encoding. Um, we use this uh, Fourier features, and that enables us to uh, predict of higher frequency um, style details. So we start with this uh, input mesh. We have the target text prompt that describes the style. And we pass uh, the XYZ coordinates from the mesh surface into this positional encoding. And um, through this neural style uh, network, and then we get these uh, colors and displacements along the normal direction. So the way that this is guided is by uh, rendering the, the 3D object through this differentiable render. We get multiple uh, 2D views, and then we apply augmentations um, to each view, and then we measure the similarity um, from each of these augmentations to the uh, target text prompt. And this is the signal that we use to update 
the weights of the neural uh, style field network. So all these components are actually very important. Um, if we remove any of them, uh, the system like, won't perform uh, as, de as desired. So um, in particular, if we start to remove the augmentations, if we start to remove the positional encoding, the, the, the neural network weights, uh, we see um, some degradations that I'll show you. And really what we thought was kind of fascinating was that there is um, a lot of sort of degenerate solutions within the, the clip um, embedding space. So there was a valid uh, target text prompt like done it with sprinkles and the result would be something that's like completely noisy and um, it would say there's like a high similarity. So these Augmentations are, are these regularizations help avoid these kind of bad solutions. Okay, so here's what they're going to start to look like. Um, so we use these priors to guide the the style network. Um, and let's look at like this example: a candle made of, a candle made of bark. And if we our system uh, achieve, achieves this result, but um, if we remove this, uh, just the, the weights of the neural style flow network, and instead of optimizing the vertex colors um, through, through the neural style flow network, we would just uh, optimize their values directly. So again, if we don't optimize the neural style field network, and instead we just optimize, right, we can just directly optimize color and displacement, the result is, is not good. It's like overly noisy. And so I, I think that's also interesting because it's like we see this kind of reoccurring theme of deep uh, priors, like without any sort of trained data, they just regularize the solutions. So that's very cool. Um, Probably the most crucial component of the system, which is a little bit perplexing, but it, it, it's by far like the most crucial piece is these 2D augmentations. Um, so without running uh, 2D augmentations, so this perspective transformation in the 2D image, um, the results are basically completely meaningless. Um, so that's this part of the pipeline here for each image we, um, apply these perspective transformations, multiple perspective transformations per view that are not necessarily consistent. Um, so like I mentioned before, we have this kind of low dimensional coordinates that need to map to higher dimensional style uh, frequencies, right? Um, and we've kind of started to hear that neural networks have this thing called a spectral bias, which means that they uh, tend towards these overly smooth solutions. And so the way that at least uh, we thought about solving this is using the uh, positional encodings of fast Fourier feature networks. Um, and this is what enables us to obtain the fine grained results. So without that, the results are, are overly smooth. And that's um, this part of the system here. So Another interesting property of these uh, fast Fourier features is that they give us some control over the frequency of the, the generated results. So if we have uh, some donut and we say we want it to be a stained glass donut and we increase the, the sigma, which is uh, essentially the amount of frequencies that are going into the positional encodings, we get more frequencies in the, in the stylized result. So the other thing that I mentioned previously is that we, on the one hand, we restrict the geometry, right? We don't want it to move uh, too much, to be too far away from the, from the original content. On the other hand, we do want to obtain meaningful geometric uh, displacements. And so the way that we uh, enforce that is we essentially um, include something called like this geometry only loss term. So we remove the color from the rendering. So we only take the displacements of the, of the neural style field. We produce a black and white image, and then we, um, we adapt only the geometry to conform to the, 
the target style. So that um, forces kind of the geometric uh, displacements to, to do something meaningful in terms of um, their, the clip similarity of the rendering. And so if we remove that, um, you can see that the results is much smoother. Uh, also, it's, it's kind of difficult sometimes to tell in general um, whether it's, it's smooth or not without kind of removing the color. Sometimes um, it's able to create these interesting like hallucinations that simulate something that's geometry, but not really. So the last um, thing that was important in our system to encourage these um, local geometric displacements is uh, cropping augmentations. So especially for something like a, like a stylization that's kind of local, we want to kind of focus on these um, small details and, and we are able to do that by um, looking at these local crops. So if we remove that, the result is much less fine-grained. Um, so here we can see all of the results kind of uh, of the, this ablation um, in motion. Uh, one thing I think is really cool is this uh, 3D. So you, I explained all of these um, except for the 3D prior. So the 3D mesh itself acts as a geometric prior, right? It kind of tells you here's where the style of, of something should go. It, it gives you some signal. Uh, especially in the case of the, the humans that I showed you earlier. Um, and in the case of uh, what you're seeing here for this 3D prior, so we just took a 2D image uh, and we just moved it around in 3D. So we still get the same augmentation. Every, the whole system is exactly the same. All we're doing is taking a 2D image plane and lifting it to 3D. Um, and so you can see that it basically treats that plane like a canvas, right? Like there's no content, there's no candle aspect here, even though it's a candle made of bark, it just um, puts bark everywhere. So how do we kind of pick the right uh, viewing angle? Like, you know, we have a candle or a camel and uh, I guess one thing that we thought about was, were we just gonna take these weird views that look like from uh, awkward viewpoints? Um, and so what we did is we decided to uh, propose this technique for automatically detecting uh, what we call like a meaningful viewpoint or an anchor view. So the reason we call it an anchor view is that we select this meaningful viewpoint and then we anchor uh, the camera around that view. So we randomly sample camera locations around that point. Um, the way we extract that point is we first just uniformly, like you see here in this half dome, uniformly sample the half dome, the half dome in uh, every direction. It's a full dome in our case. Um, and then we just compare the uh, clip score to, to the target uh, text prompt. So here we color the, the camel with the target text prompt that we were um, that we were interested in, in stylizing. And so you could see that like the good views kind of make sense, right? It's, it's the side of the camel. Uh, we don't see any bad views. I actually don't know if they exist. Um, have to ask. Uh, Richard, who ran this, but um, we see good views and we see a lot of borderline good views. And at the end of the day, um, it turns out that like you can select kind of a lot of these views and you'll get something meaningful. As long as it's like one of these kind of reasonable views, then the result is good. And we don't just get the stylization around the anchor view because we are sampling around that point. So we're getting uh, multiple images all around the shape just with a lower probability. Um, and so that kind of biases it, the, the results towards one kind of main anchor view, but at the end of the day, we still get this meaningful stylization over the whole shape. And in particular, I think the donkey wearing jeans is kind of interesting because he has some global semantics, right? Like his feet are kind of a different color than his body and um, his head is a different color. Um, so there's some, there's some kind of uh, global semantics going on there. So to, to recap how this whole system works, we have uh, a 3D mesh as input, uh, some target uh, text prompt, 
we sample XYZ points on the mesh, pass that through positional encoding and an MLP uh, network, which branches out and predicts a color and displacement. We add that back to the original mesh, render it out from multiple different views and apply augmentations to those views and update the weights of the neural style field until uh, it, it converges. And it takes about like 10 minutes to get pretty good results, um, 25 minutes, like, and then it's uh, complete. So um, it's pretty fast, relatively speaking, because there's no, there's no training, um, at least that we, that we had to run. Um, so a cool thing about this is that we can do this kind of blend shapes, um, blending between different uh, stylizations of the same uh, 3D object, right? So we have uh, this one vase and then we give it all these different styles and we can interpolate between them, and, uh, see all the interesting views. And here's another one. So actually our, our system is general. I, I think uh, our system works kind of is primarily targeted towards text and text seems to be, I would say the most um, successful modality of this, but it's general in that we can also apply an image to uh, as this kind of semantic objective, right? Because the nice thing about this clip space is that we can just embed an image uh, into the same uh, five 12 dimensional space space and then we get um uh the same kind of high level uh update we can also do the same thing with a mesh so we take a different mesh we can render it uh, for multiple views and then encode it through the image encoder and then again get the similarity so here's uh some results of this uh, pig stylized with these um, image targets And here's uh, a few different examples of target meshes um, that are smaller here on the bottom and uh, the corresponding stylizations. So like I mentioned before, um, we, because we use this uh, render, we don't actually have to apply any geometry uh, algorithms on, on the system. So, there's sort of no issues in having non-manifold meshes, uh, intersections, boundaries, uh, all sorts of problematic elements, and, and the system still works fine, the same, basically. Like, we don't observe, like, a significant uh, degradation. I think, actually, this mesh was already not in great shape um, beforehand. So another thing that's kind of interesting is we can do this um, increasing granularity of stylization, which is kind of interesting for um, people that are interested in kind of uh, fine grain classification, right? There's this um, evolving sort of style that changes. And if you notice, there's something that looks kind of specular here. Um, and there's no specularity in this, right? It just said RGB colors and displacements. So it's somehow able to hallucinate specularity like through RGB colors, which is like amazing. I don't know how it does it. Um, same thing with this uh, lamp. So we get these specular um, results, increasing granularity, we can keep adding these um, interesting uh, specifications. The other thing that was um, interesting that we started to look into is that we can enforce uh, symmetries through the positional encoding. So like say you know that the object has a symmetry in the z-axis. Uh, you can just apply that function, like absolute value function, 
before passing it to the positional encoding, and then you get this reflection kind of by construction. All right, so even if, for example, you have a mesh that's like asymmetric, but you know there's a symmetry, a bilateral symmetry, like it's a human, but the, the triangulation is not exactly symmetric. So actually this will give you a symmetric um, stylization by sort of construction, which seems like this could be a uh, interesting promising direction in general. Like how do we um, maybe detect these symmetries? Like clearly there's, there's some information in there because we were, we were able to, to create symmetric stylizations as well. So I showed you, I think, uh, an interesting work that I'm personally pretty excited about. Um, and I should probably take this time to thank like, all the students that were involved, uh, Oscar, Roy, and, and Richard, and also Sagi. And um, I'm looking forward to pursuing this avenue more because, like I said, kind of gives us some things that I think were, were difficult to achieve before. And thank you for listening. Our code is online. Please do uh, reach out to us if you uh, use it for something interesting or have a question, um, let us know. Cool. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I guess some, some questions are already being answered in the YouTube chat right now, which is kind of funny. OK. That's <laughs> Richard, good. Richard is answering the questions there. <laughs> um, no, super cool talk. Um, and of course, very, very exciting work. Um, if there are any questions um, in, in the Zoom, like just, I guess, ask right now. I have a couple, but I want to give everybody else the opportunity to. Uh, yeah, I would have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So thanks for the amazing talk. It's a uh, very cool results that you're showing. I wanted to ask about the expressiveness of this clip embedding space. So in particular, in comparison to image-based style transfer. So there normally um, you could say that um, the copying of the style statistics are um, not giving too much explicit control like an artist would do for specific portions of the 3D content, for example. So these style okay. statistics are just pasted around. And it seems that here this space is learning which parts of the mesh should be painted in which type of the text prompt. So what do you think are the constraints here of this embedding space? Could this also be applied to room scale seasons? And how large can the sentences be? Or yeah, like what is the limit of the expressiveness of the space, basically? Yeah. No, those are really good questions. I think like one of the things that I'm excited about is that I feel like we have no idea <laughs> like about a lot of this stuff, which is what which is why it's kind of interesting to to think about it and discuss it. And so from the perspective of the length of the text prompts, maybe we didn't try long enough prompts. I guess I feel like, although Richard sounds like he's in the chat, I feel like we didn't get to the point where we tried long enough prompts, or at least I don't remember that, um, like, yeah, I don't remember like too long um, failures there. But definitely the it seems to be the way that's easiest to control is simply through text. It's ac actually, when we wanted to control uh, the stylization through images, we would supplement that with text because like text is kind of like abstract and it's almost like it doesn't constrain the system in a way that an image might, like an image might kind of pigeonhole you into one specific area, whereas text is something kind of more high level. And so there's multiple images that could potentially fit a particular text description. So that was one like hypothesis that we had is that because it's more abstract that it could actually create, it could conform better. It could like be more flexible than say something that's more rigid. But I think like one interesting direction is to try and understand how to inject like more control over the result. I'm not like hundred percent sure how mm -hmm. to do that. But I think one, one interesting thing is like adding semantics, right? Like adding uh, like a segmentation or a, I don't know, something, something that could like extract maybe the segmentation and, and leverage that somehow. 
yeah, thanks. Maybe probably also applying this to room scale scenes with semantic loss would give right. this explicit control for larger meshes. Yeah, so I don't think there's a particular issue. Uh, so there's one constraint of clip, which is that it takes 224 by 224 images. It's actually not a problem, I think, for a scene because even for the single object, right, we don't see the whole thing in one view. So for a scene, you could have, you could have, I guess, an infinitely large scene, right? And then just, it's a matter of time to just go through and extract all the views and update that. Um, I forgot now the details of it, but I think what we did do is we averaged over like all these different views. Um, so, you know, that, that might be something like, I think there was a little bit of like black magic there. What, what made sense in terms of how to combine all the multiple views, like whether it makes sense to average the embedding and then compare the embedding versus, um, yeah, there was like a, a few different variations that we tried that I don't exactly remember all the details of, but um, there's probably more to it there in terms of a larger scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I got actually an, a question regarding the, I mean, I think the key is really the parameterization, right? So if you like, I mean, you have basically color and displacements right now, right? Um, how do you imagine this going forward, right? I mean, basically, I don't know, extreme case, take something like polychain and stuff like this, right? And right. Is, is the challenge really that, oh, we, we're, we're struggling making generic generative models on 3D and this is just really, really difficult? Or was it always be an issue of, oh, we just didn't have enough data and maybe with this like 2D projection or so on that you're doing, um, it's easier. Yeah, I, I feel like I was trying to put my finger on it uh, in the past because I felt like differentiable rendering a lot of times it was hard to get meaningful results outside of the render that you actually developed, right? Like you had a differentiable render, you render out the mesh and then you could maybe do like 2D image correspondence that, that way. But then like some natural image in, in the world, now you wanna kind of modify your geometry based on that. Was, there was no kind of pixel level um, supervision. And I feel like one thing that Clip does is it does abstract like the fact that this was obtained from clearly a synthetic, it's not a, not a natural image. It's a synthetic image, it's a computer generated image, but it's still able to just abstract that away into something that like removes the artifacts. Um, I don't know, I think, I feel like that's like maybe why it does work. Um, and the other part of your question was like generating the actual content itself, right? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my question is right, like basically, you have already all the basis of the topology and everything given, right? right. And and then you're displacing and you're adding the color, which again is not trivial. I, I understand that. Um, yeah. But in this case, the projection and everything is mostly fixed, right? So you, yeah. you're not like if you had to start from scratch and hit to synthesize the whole topology from like nothing, then this is yeah. a lot harder because now you suddenly have a lot of discontinuities when you do projections and so on. And then these features probably don't project so nicely back. So I'm, I don't know, and yeah. it seems a lot more complicated than. I, I definitely think you're right. Probably the way to go about generating content is like through primitives or something, like something really coarse. Cause like, I guess, yeah, if you're starting from like scratch, scratch, it's like too, yeah, it feels too abstract. I mean, I guess you don't like, the, I think the challenge is you don't have anything then, right? Like, like, but you can start with a sphere at the extreme case, right? And then. yeah like try to deform it and modify it and possibly adapt the topology as you go. Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. I think like... I mean, I buy the premise, like what, you, what you're doing is, is fantastic in the sense of like leveraging all the stuff from 2D as a loss to guide the 3D generative process. Now the question is, right? Like how do we make this more, more, more flexible in a sense of like what kind of models you can generate at the end? Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing I um, couldn't unfortunately discuss, but um, I think is really interesting is this idea of like handling these topology issues that we have with meshes, because when I, a lot of the work that I've done has been focused on meshes and generating meshes with arbitrary topology is hard. Um, 
So I feel like if we can, yeah, combine that somehow, like get these kind of coarse shapes, not, not a lot of detail actually, relatively speaking, like probably could be a low resolution voxel grid, <laughs> do some subdivision and like get something that's reasonable. Um, to, to like go as a precursor to something like this. Although something, yeah, end to end would be a little more exciting, I think. Cool, any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, thank you, Arno, for this uh, amazing talk. Um, I actually really like uh, this work. And uh, there have been some concurrent works that are trying to do also clip-based uh, 3D generation, but uh, I think they were not uh, as successful uh, as this work uh, with this regularization and all of this. Um, I, I just have one comment regarding the, um, the main signal you're using uh, in the optimization, which is about the average uh, the average uh, clip feature of all of the augmented views uh, and the current distance with the text embedding. So uh, are these average, uh, the average is actually um, like uh, the correct or the, the best way to represent the entire shape? Because uh, like when you average, let's say the top view with the bottom view, that doesn't really, maybe they are actually like uh, not in the same direction. You see my point? They might actually yeah. contradict each other. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting direction to think about these things. Um, like one thing I thought about was, can we encode? Okay, so one thing we noticed that happened like very early on was that when we didn't do this average embedding, but like that was before we added a lot of other things. So I'm not sure if this is like exactly the reason is that we had these like hallucinations. So we would have like, for example, a person, we would have multiple eyes and like you would, you would see based on where the camera was, it would just put the face in different places. Um, and so one thing I thought about is, well, if we're looking at the side of the face and we want that to be a face, like of course it's gonna put a face there, right? Like why wouldn't it? Um, and like I was thinking, well, in that case, I guess we would want it to not be a face, but like the left side of the face or like the profile of the face. Like maybe we could use language to guide what should be on the side or in a different um, view. But I didn't really think about it until you asked this question now, which is like, maybe there could be a, I think there could be a better embedding space than yeah. Clip, Clip did a lot of amazing stuff. So I'm not like, you know, you always, like the first work rate is always the, the one with the most improvement afterwards. But like, you could imagine maybe embedding space with like, um, meaning in terms of the direction maybe or something like that like some other kind of i don't know changing the direction of the text such yeah. such that it would match the viewpoint yeah uh so uh, another uh, question is regarding uh, the uh, uh, the change or the modification on the text on the uh, the vertices of the mesh so I've been experimenting with this since it came out on GitHub. And like what I noticed is the small parts, let's say the hands of the body usually would get actually destroyed rather than like modified in a meaningful way in most of the times. Um, so is this like a problem since like, uh, you're not adding any regularization as far as I understand like a Laplacian or uh, on the, uh, modification of the mesh such that it can be smooth and yeah. uh, while this actually allows you to get like these very high detailed and high frequency textures it also can um, basically destroy uh, uh, finer uh, parts like the hands for example yeah yeah no totally I think like one thing we really wanted to try was the Laplacian smoothing before we uh, submitted and we just didn't have the chance um, I think Ray did try like some uh, some other type of regularization, but he said um, it, it, he wasn't able to get it to work properly. Um, so ba yeah, basically we didn't try this Laplacian smoothing, but I think it could be inter something interesting to try. Certainly like, especially the humans, right? It's such a semantic thing that the, the distortions in the hands like really bother us, right? Yeah. Like, more so than a distortion like, 
I see distortions in the in the lamp, right, on the on the neck thing, but we can sort of justify it and say it's just like a bump or a what, like it's it's okay for us, but like the the stuff in the hands that looks like not good. Um, and yeah, like I don't, a, yeah, yeah. Um, good. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about like maybe uh, doing things in a hierarchical way, such that like. Uh, every part would be treated differently in the shape, something like that. But yeah, I was just thinking about this problem. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting to like treat things uh, as separate like segments. Right now everything is shared, right? That's probably a bad thing from the perspective of the um, semantics. Somehow, potentially with the positional encoding, it's able to figure out what part is what but I totally agree that if it had this like segmentation, it could do something more tailored to that area and preserve it better. Cool. Any other questions? All right, then if no further questions, um, thanks again. I think this was really awesome. Um, obviously I think we all, we all really like the work um cool yeah then see you everybody else for the next lecture i'm gonna end the stream <laughs>